Now, how many, how many have been here like 20, 20 years? Anyone who's been here longer than 20 years? Yeah, we've got my wife and the, the, the Waleses and a few others as well. Uh, some of you will remember that back in my youth pastoring days, which is about 20 to 25 years ago, I could hardly preach a message. There was a period of time where I could hardly preach a message without a particular character coming up in my messages. Who can remember who that was? Can someone... Yep, you yell it out. Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> Buzz Lightyear. How many know Buzz Lightyear? Yeah, yeah, you know who I'm talking about? Well, here he is. He's, a, he's the man. And there was just a period of time when uh, we bought the, 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 the Buzz Lightyear movie. Now, this is obviously the Toy Story character. But the Buzz Lightyear movie was a cartoon movie that was produced after, this move, after the Toy Story movie to kind of give a bit of background to this character called Buzz Lightyear. And he was a space ranger. He was protecting the galaxy from the evil Emperor Zerg and, uh, and all of that sort of stuff. And, uh, but anyway, when I used to watch that movie, you know, it was just, it was just there was this incredible sense of, um, of truth coming through, which was absolutely incredible. And so Buzz Lightyear is going to make another entrance into the service today. But let me just ask you this. Ask, ask, can I ask you a question? How many people here really want to make a difference with your life? Give me a bit of a wave. You want your life to make a difference. Well, I want to encourage you with this fact that your Christian faith can make an immense difference in the world. Whether you realize it or not, there's a battle raging around each of us, uh, around all of us, around our world, between good and evil. The Bible describes it as a battle between light and darkness. The Bible refers to followers of Jesus as soldiers of the light. We're in a battle and we're, and we're called to fight the good fight, replete with armor and everything. This is one of the motifs that the Bible uses, one of the illustrations that the Bible uses to describe the Christian faith. It's one of these other, other um, exam, uh, illustrations as well. But let's uh, remember there's this one that, this, that talks about a battle. You and I are soldiers. We have armor. Now, let's come to my friend Buzz Lightyear, because he's a soldier. And... Um, now, let me just paint the scene for you. In the, in the Buzz Lightyear movie, there was this particular scene where, where Buzz made a quote, which I really feel is, uh, is, is powerful for us this morning. He was, he'd been captured by the evil Emperor Zerg. And, uh, and basically, uh, all of Star Command, which was, uh, which was Buzz Lightyear's organization that he, that he uh, fought with, Star Command had come under Zerg's mind control except for Buzz and his three estranged companions who, had been, uh, who he had rejected and sent away at this point in the movie. So now Buzz is facing almost certain execution by Zerg and his henchmen. And in a show of triumphant ecstasy, Zerg throws his head back and yells out that famous line, Evil rules! You familiar with that? Anybody? Yeah, one or two? Okay. So here he is, really feeling like he's got, he's got Buzz nailed. And then he turns to Buzz and he says, uh, have you got any final words you'd like to say? Any last things you'd like to say before you go to your death? And Buzz says, yes, I do. And so he begins to speak and he talks about his life and he confesses his mistakes, namely his failure to keep his, his three companions close to him. And then with an air of confidence that, that few can muster, that only the space ranger could muster himself, he points his finger at Zerg and he says, Zerg, there's one thing you've forgotten. And Zerg gets all kind of, you know, um, uh, um, insecure and worried. He says, oh, what's that? And Buzz pointing at him, he says, evil never wins. You know, and I think to myself, there's something about that that you and I need to get a hold of. Because evil never wins. Evil never wins. You can, you can think to yourself, oh man, there's so much evil going on in the world today. It's like, what's happening? Friends, I'm here to tell you, evil never wins. Light always wins over darkness. You know. And so the title of my message this morning is, Evil Never Wins. If you're taking notes, write that down this morning. That's the title. It's something that we need to get very, very clear in our heads and in our hearts today. If we are going to live victorious, overcoming lives, friends, evil never wins. 
There's something we need to be absolutely clear about if we're going to make a difference in the world in which we live, friends, that evil never wins. Now, with uh, having a baptism service today, and, and I love the thought about what baptism actually represents. You see, baptism is a symbol of the overcoming, overwhelming victory over the ultimate results of evil, which is sin and death. Baptism is a symbol of putting death to death. Think about that for a moment. This is literally what Jesus did on the cross. He put death to death so that um, as the, the, so the person who goes under the water, what happens is their old sinful nature is drowned. This is what it symbolized. And as they rise up out of the water, they're rising to a new nature that is incapable of death. Think about that. This is an incredible, incredible thing. Evil doesn't win. Now, we read about this whole uh, victory over death in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 54 to 56. Let me just read this, and you can follow through with me on your iPad or whatever if you want to, or through your Bible. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 54 to 56. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what, what, do you, um, what do you do if you enter a fight that has already been won? How do you conduct yourself? What is it that you need to do if you're entering a fight that's already been won? Well, what you do is you simply enforce the victory. You stand your ground until your adversary realizes you mean business and they give up. So I, I, I quite like watching um, those uh, police TV reality shows. You know the ones I'm talking about? You know the ones where you've got um, you know, a cameraman and, and somebody, they, they travel along for the ride in a police car with a couple of cops and they drive out there you know, down like K Road or somewhere at you know, early hours of the morning and they, they find people that are, you know, that are disturbing the peace and they, they kind of uh, interact with them. And it's, it's quite interesting really and it always cracks me up when the police are making an arrest of some guy who's causing trouble and he tries to play mind games with them, questioning their authority. Have you seen that before? And it's like this guy's, and he's going on about, you know, you're useless cops, you know, and you, you should be ashamed of yourself and all this sort of stuff. And, and what I find really interesting at those sort of times is that um, the rookie officers, you know, the, the, beginner, the, the guys that are just fresh out of police college, they don't really know what they're about yet, and uh, they tend to get caught up in the conversation, and they get all agitated, and, and uh, you know, you can see them getting worked up, you know, and they're, they're kind of starting to argue and just getting a bit, bit uh, frustrated and agitated. But the seasoned officers, they don't fall for that. Those guys that have been around a few years and they've faced a bit of this stuff, they don't fall for that rubbish. Why? Because they just know that the, the authority that they carry and they know there's no need to get drawn into the psychological battle of words. What do they do? They just put handcuffs on the sucker and shove them in the car. Says, you're coming down to the station with us. They just ignore them. And I love that. Because right there we've got a picture of what you and I need to be like as Christian people. We need to understand the authority that we have in Christ and not get caught up, not get caught up in these rubbishy little um, side arguments that the devil wants us to get caught up in, questioning who, who do you think you really are. Church, you and I need to learn from this. We don't need to get drawn into the enemy's lies and schemes to pull us down and trap us in fear and defeat. Instead, we need to know the authority of Jesus in our lives and just stand our ground. Just stand your ground against some of this stuff. Now, Jesus told a really interesting story about a widow woman who knew her authority and who knew that evil never wins. Let me share this story with you in Luke chapter 18, and we start at verse 1 through to verse 5. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. 
And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For, for some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice. So she eventually, so she won't eventually come and attack me. He's worried that this widow woman's going to come and attack him. In fact, some translations uh, put it this way. They say, uh, so that she won't wear me out. Do you know that you can wear the devil out? Did you know that? You can wear him out. He's not, he's not um, you know, invincible. If you know the authority that you stand in, you can stand against the attacks of the enemy and you can wear him down. But you've got to know. You've got to know your authority. You've got to be like this woman. You see, I ask, I ask myself, what did the widow, what, um, why did the widow keep bothering the judge? What gave her the tenacity to keep going back day after day after day after day demanding justice? And every time he's saying, no, I don't care about you. I'm not going to give you justice. she just go back the next day. And she'd ask again and again, what kept her doing that? What gave her that sort of tenacity? It was because she knew that she would get the justice she sought because just injustice never wins. Evil never wins. Injustice never wins. Friends, you've got to get that into your spirit. Otherwise, you'll give up. And then evil will win. You say, oh, Russell, I thought you said evil never wins. It'll never win if you don't let it. There was a statement that was made by a, a great preacher years ago. He said, all it takes for evil to flourish is good men to do nothing. Do you know all it takes for the evil that the enemy has already been uh, decommissioned from? He's already been, um, you know, defeated. All it takes for his evil to win is for you and I not to know who, what, what our authority is in Christ and to give up and to stop fighting this stuff. What is the evil that's facing you today? Is it, is it bullying in the workplace or at school? Is it injustice from the legal system? I've got good news for you, friends. You don't need to put up with it. You say, yeah, but it's really hard. They give me a hard time. Friends, you don't have to put up with it. What can you do? What can you do? You can go to your employer or to the school dean, and you can demand justice on the knowledge that injustice is wrong and never wins. And if they fob you off, you just go back. Just go back and go back and go back again until finally they realize you ain't going to give up. And they realize, heck, we better do something about this. Because you see, people will try to fob you off. People will try to take the easy road. But if you know what you know, that injustice never wins, that evil never wins, and you're not going to give up, you'll get what you're after. This is the, the lesson that we see from the, the widow with the unjust judge. Church, we need to learn to fight. Like the widow, we must learn not to accept no for an answer when we're pursuing the good and the right. Maybe the evil is being faced by a workmate or by another student at school. Then you and I can be their advocate. We can fight on their behalf. We can go to the school dean for them. We can go to the boss for them on their behalf. Remember this. When you fight for justice, you have almighty God on your side. And if God is for us, this side, if God is for us, down the back, if God is for us, louder. <laughs> Church, we've got to get it. Because I see far too many defeated Christians. I see people running around going, oh, it's so hard, it's so tough. You know, why is everybody against me? But God is for you. Understand that you can stand up. You say, well, why doesn't God just destroy all the enemy? Why did he just kill the devil when he died on the cross? I'll tell you why. Because you and I need to grow. We need to, have, we need to fight a good fight. You know, the Bible says fight a good fight. What's a good fight? It's one you win. A bad fight is one you lose. It says fight the good fight. It's not just that you win. It's already been won. You just got to enforce the victory. What are the, What other evils? are you dealing with? What other things are you facing right now? What's the devil trying to throw at you that Jesus actually declared you free from? Is it sickness? Is it, 
Is it, is it depression? Is it unwarranted guilt? You know, I say unwarranted guilt because I see a lot of people carrying guilt around over things that they're not guilty of. There's stuff that they didn't do, stuff that they're, but they're, but they're somehow carrying guilt. Where's that coming from? It's coming from the enemy of your soul. And it's, it's, it's illegal. Let's put it that in those sort of terms. But you've got to stand against it. You've got to stand up against this stuff. What about, what about a sense of failure or unworthiness? How many of us carry around that kind of sense of failure and sense of I don't measure up? Well, guess what? That is an evil that has already been doomed to failure. It can't win. You've, made, you, you've been made righteous by the blood of Jesus and you are already the winner. If you've given your life to Christ, if you've made a decision to live your life for Jesus, friend, you've been made righteous and all of those things have already been defeated, those evils against you. You're already the winner. So, like the widow in the story, you can actually rise up and demand justice. You can pray to God with the confidence that eventually you will wear that evil down and you will get all that you are seeking. You and I need to get this in our spirit. Listen, we can, we can sit around here and we can hear the rhetoric of God is for me, who can be against me, and we can walk away untouched. Or we can let it get into our spirit. We go, wow, God, you are for me. Jesus, you have done the work. You've finished it. Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. Do you know what? He actually meant it. He actually meant it. But we need to understand how this thing works. Because you and I need to rise up. And you know, there's that scripture, and I think it's Ephesians 6. It says, having done everything to stand. Stand. Stand in your place. Stand on what? Stand on the truth. The evil never wins. Stand on the truth that injustice will never prevail. You, may, you might say, well, Russell, there's a lot of justice, injustice prevailing in the world today. Do you know the Bible says that there is no injustice that will not be brought to justice eventually? I don't know how Jesus is going to do it. I don't need to know. I just need to know that he will. And then I can stand on it. I just think, I just think we need to get a bit more steel and a bit more grit and determination. I think this is what the world are looking for. I think they're looking for people who know what they're about, who aren't arrogant about it, but who just stand firm, fight for justice, stand against the enemy. Like that widow, rise up and demand justice. Pray with confidence. Listen, listen to the final part of the passage that we just read earlier about the persistent widow. Listen to this. In Luke chapter 18, verse 6 to 8, I love this bit. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Will he find people that listen to the pastor on Sunday, the 28th of April, 2019? Will he find this kind of standing firm faith on the earth? Friends, I want to tell you right now, as far as my watch is concerned, he's going to find it in salt. Because I'm going to keep preaching this stuff until we've got it. I'm going to keep exhibiting it in my own life until we have got it. Let me tell you, trouble is coming your way. He said, Russell, I thought the church was supposed to be an encouraging place that made us feel happy. <laughs> Trouble is coming your way. Are you ready to face it? Because it doesn't need to take you out. Evil never wins. Unless you haven't got that in your spirit. And you get bowled over by it. You go, oh, no. Didn't know it was going to be this hard. Well, Jesus said it would be. He said, you will have trouble. But take heart. Why? Because I have overcome the world. Evil doesn't win. Church, Jesus gave us the story of the persistent widow to show us that we need to develop tenacity in our prayer life. We've got to pray like we mean it. We need to get it clear in our heads and our heart, the victory that ours in Christ, and we need to learn to pray like we really believe it. Parents, do you have a wayward child that's not living for Jesus right now? then start to pray for them like their destiny depends on it. Start to declare God's promise that he will finish the work that he started. Isn't that what the scriptures say? He who started the work 
will be faithful to complete it in you. And you can say as parents, he who started the work in my son or in my daughter is faithful and will complete that work. On my watch, I'm declaring justice. Evil is not going to win over my kids. You getting this? Church, there are, there are people here, you're not parents yet, but you're going to face this battle. So start to build up your spiritual muscle now so that when you meet that battle, you meet it head on with victory, with a victory mentality. You know, begin to declare that they will fulfill their destiny and calling in God. Begin to pray earnestly for a burning bush experience of God's reality for them. An encounter that will radically impact their life and switch them on for Jesus. You might go, whoa, Russell, you just lost me right there. What's burning bush has got to do with anything? Okay, well, let me explain. In the Old Testament, there's a story about this awesome guy called Moses. Moses thought he had it all together. He started rushing out there to do what God had called him to do, but he messed it up because he did it in his own strength. He got chased out of Egypt. He ran off into the desert, and he's kind of, for the next 40 years, running from God's purposes for his life. And he was lost. He was just completely lost. You could say he backslid. He lost his faith in God. One day, he's out there looking after the sheep, just doing his desert stuff, like so many people who are just wandering around in the desert, just doing their desert things. And then he sees this bush, and it's on fire. And he stood and watched it for three, four, or five minutes. And he noticed that the bush didn't burn. The fire was burning, but the bush didn't seem to be getting concerned. He goes, wow, this is amazing. I've never seen this before. I'm going to go over and have a closer look. And suddenly God got his attention. Do you know that you, parents, you might have children out there in the desert, and there's going to come a burning bush experience one day for them. Because I believe with all my heart that God uses the desert to make firebrands for his kingdom. You see, what happened for Moses was that he had this encounter with God. Suddenly he thought, man, I've got to take my shoes off because God's in this place. This is a holy place. And God put a fire in his spirit, sent him back to Egypt. He got him back on track. He got stuck in and did the will of God in the power of God. What caused that? The burning bush experience in the wilderness. We see this principle over and over and over in Scripture. You and I need to know this as parents so that we can fight for our kids. You need to know it for your friends that have kind of lost their way in God. You need to fight for them. Start declaring, no, the finished work of God is going to be finished in their life. This, the, whole, the whole desert thing, we see this pattern through Scripture. It happened with uh, the Apostle Paul. He spent 14 years in the desert. He, he met with Jesus in the desert, and he came back full of faith and full of fire to start the church, basically, or get the church up and running. Even Jesus spent his time in the desert, fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, and he had this incredible encounter with the devil and with God, and then he came back full of fire and faith and anointing to start his ministry. Friends, don't, don't think the desert's the end of it. The desert's not the end of it. It's just the beginning for some of our people. It's just the beginning. Fight for them. Fight for them. Don't sit down and lick your wounds and conclude that they are lost. Don't sit down and lick your wounds and conclude that the sickness you're dealing with will never go. Don't sit down and lick your wounds and, and think that the insecurities you face and the depression that you deal with is yours forever. Stand and fight. Start to declare the justice of God and start to declare that evil never wins. See, to, to give up, that's exactly what the devil wants you to do. He wants you to believe those, those rubbishy lies. That's like the widow giving up and concluding that the unjust judge has won and that she'll never get justice. Imagine if the story went that way. I'm glad it didn't go that way. I'm glad she knew who she was. I'm glad she knew her authority because she gave us a great example. Don't fall for the rubbish that the enemy's got it all over you. He hasn't. Jesus has won the victory at the cross. We're going to watch a short movie clip about a guy called Winston Churchill. How many, give me a wave if you know of Winston Churchill. Yet some of us may have seen there was a documentary, uh, sorry, a movie on uh, uh, Anzac Day about Winston Churchill. Well, there's another movie called The Darkest Hour, and it's just an incredible uh, movie. And, and in this clip, what we've got is Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister of England. He was the newly elected Prime Minister to lead England through World War II. There was a realization that the previous prime minister didn't have the guts. He didn't have the gall. He just wanted to sue for peace and, and, and uh, conditions of, of, you know, negotiate conditions of peace, which wasn't going to happen with the Nazi regime. Winston Churchill knew this. He was appointed prime minister. And what we're going to watch is his speech to the, to the, par the British parliament calling them to war. Now, this is not a Christian man. He doesn't have a basis for faith like you and I have got. 
But listen to the passion in the heart of this man and see if there's something we need to catch as Christians from this. We shall prove ourselves once more able to defend our island home, to ride out the storm of war, and to outlive the menace of tyranny, if necessary, for years, if necessary, alone. At any rate, that is what we are, are going to try to do. That is the result of His Majesty's government, every man of them. To your right, of it. That is the will of Parliament and the nation. The British Empire and the French Republic, linked together in their cause and in their name, will defend to the death their native soil. <laughs> Aiding each other like good comrades to the utmost of their strength. <laughs> Even though large tracts of Europe and many old and famous states have, have fallen or may fall into the, the grip of the Gestapo and all the odious apparatus of the Nazi rule. We shall not flag or fail. We shall go on to the end! <laughs> we shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with, with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. <laughs> we shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. Yeah. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender! Yeah. And if, which I, I, I do not for a moment believe, this island or large part of it were, were, were subjugated and starving, then our empire be on the seas, armed and guarded by the British fleet, would carry on the struggle. God's good time, the new world, with all its power and might, steps forth to the rescue and the liberation of the old. What is the evil that is assailing you this morning? What is the evil that is assailing your home, your family, your business, your health? What is the evil in your school or workplace or in the community that bothers you? Child of God, it's time for you to rise up. It's time for you to demand justice. 
It's time for you to declare war and stand your ground. In Luke 18, verse 7 to 8, let me repeat those words again that we read earlier. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see they get justice and quickly. Friends, you have the backing of heaven behind you. But when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? God, I pray right now, Lord, I pray right now that you'd stir our hearts to be people that are determined. Lord, we're going to make good on the victory that you won on the cross. We're going to stand firm, Lord God. We're going to become people of backbone, people, Lord God, of spiritual backbone, people of faith. Thank you that you put death to death when you died on the cross. And Lord, we're about to celebrate that symbolically as one of our own number is baptized this morning. What a beautiful thing. God, I pray for every person this morning. Would you stir our hearts? And of course, Lord, we know that, Father, the benefits of the cross will only benefit us if we've made a decision to make you our Lord and our Savior, to make you our leader, to make you the one who would guide us and lead us and that we'd live our lives for you. Just with our heads bowed and eyes closed, I'd like to give an opportunity to anybody in the room today that hasn't yet made that decision to ask Jesus to come into your life and to be your Lord and Savior and to to apply the the truths of the gospel, the truths of of the, the cross and all it means to your life to give you the kind of victory that we've been speaking about today. Is the heads bowed and eyes closed? Is there anyone here today? Just lift your hand. Lift your hand and I'll see it and we want to pray with you. We want to lead you through a prayer. Is there somebody here this morning? Just lift your hand. Yeah, I see your hand down the front there. That's awesome. Thank you, sir. That's awesome. Is there somebody else? Just lift your hand this morning. Effectively, what you're saying is, yeah, that's me. Count me in. I want to put my faith in Jesus. Is there somebody else here this morning? Let's all stand to our feet, church. Let's all stand to our feet. And those that have lifted their hands this morning, we're going to pray a prayer. And I want to encourage you, if you lifted your hand this morning, pray these words after me, and we're all going to pray this together. Let's do that right now. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for the finished work of victory that evil would never win over my life. Holy Spirit, fill me now. I give my life to you, Jesus. I turn away from my old life and just doing it all my way. And I choose to do it your way. Help me day by day to live for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How about we give the Lord a hand this morning, church? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And if you, if you prayed that prayer this morning for maybe the first time or maybe the second or third time even, and you made a decision to come back to the Lord, then we would love to connect with you after the service and pray with you. That would be just awesome. And um, you could maybe even go to information afterwards and just let them know that, hey, look, I made this decision, and, and we will just uh, you know, do our best to help you get connected into all that's happening in church life. Isn't God good? Hey, who's feeling like a little bit more victory going on in your life right now? Come on, let's give the Lord a hand for His Word this morning, eh? Thank you, Jesus. Awesome.